What was your special order? You read it. I thought it was clear. What was it? Bring back life form. Priority one. All other priorities rescinded. Well, some of you may have figured out we're not home yet. We're only halfway there. Mother's interrupted the course of our journey. Why? Yeah. She's programmed to do that should certain conditions arise. They have. Like what? Seems she has intercepted a transmission of unknown origin. She got us up to check it out. A transmission? Out here? Yeah. What kind of a transmission? Acoustical beacon that uh, repeats at intervals of 12 seconds. SOS. I don't know. Human. See this? Yes, I can. Let's get out of here. We've got this far. We must go on. Disappeared into one of the cooling ducts. Drive it into the airlock and zap it into outer space. This son of a bitch is huge. I mean, it's like a man. It, it's big. Okay, something. Am I am I Claire Lambert? I want to get the hell out of here. Oh God, it's moving right towards you. Get out of the way, Lambert! May 25th, 1979, Alien arrived on the big screen and terrified audiences worldwide, making over $104 million, produced on a small budget of just over $8 million. And with simple but effective advertising, it proved a huge financial success for 20th Century Fox. A newcomer, Sigourney Weaver, became a superstar overnight, and Ridley Scott gained huge respect from his peers and critics for his directing talents. Over the years, Alien had come to be regarded as one of the best horror and science fiction films, making many top 10 lists. It started a franchise that has continued to this day with endless merchandise and video game tie-ins. On home video, it earned over 40 million in rentals, and in the early 90s received a special edition Laserdisc. This included deleted scenes, behind the scenes footage, screenplay excerpts and rare production stills. When it came to DVD and eventually Blu-ray, the films were given extensive behind the scenes material and documentaries. The Alien Quadrilogy box set would prove one of the best special editions of a movie series. In 2003, to celebrate its upcoming 25th anniversary, a director's cut was released that included a couple of the deleted scenes, including the Alien's hive in which it keeps the surviving member Dallas cocooned, and it appears to be turning him into an egg to continue the Alien's life cycle. Ridley Scott made minor edits to the theatrical release, making the director's cut about a minute shorter. He still regarded the theatrical cut as his preferred version, but with the re-release they had to offer something new aside from a remastered picture and sound. In the early 70s, Dan O'Bannon had written a dark science fiction comedy film with director John Carpenter. Concept artist Ron Cobb also contributed to its production design, and it was titled Dark Star. It was originally a student film that got out of hand and became too big to be a student project, and it became a feature film. It went down badly with critics and audiences though, the film included an alien which basically looked like a spray painted beach ball and the experience left Dan O'Bannon really wanted to do an alien that looked real. A few years later he began working on a similar story that would focus more on horror. 
Ronald Chusett, meanwhile, was working on an early version of what would eventually become Total Recall after obtaining the rights. Impressed by Darkstar, he contacted O'Bannon, and the two agreed to collaborate on their projects, choosing to work on Dan's film first. Dan O'Bannon had written 29 pages of a script that would become the film's opening scenes up to a point of them landing on the planet. Dan O'Bannon got an offer to work on Jodorowsky's film adaptation of Dune, a project which took him to Paris for six months to help work on the design and visual effects. Though the project ultimately fell through, it introduced him to several artists whose work gave him ideas for his science fiction story, including Chris Frost, H.R. Giger and Mobius. Giger's work had a profound effect on O'Bannon. He had never seen anything that was quite as horrific and at the same time as beautiful as his art. After the Dune project collapsed, Dan O'Bannon returned to LA to live with Ronald Shusett. Shusett suggested that O'Bannon adapt one of his other film ideas about gremlins infiltrating a B-17 bomber during World War II and to set it on a spaceship to form the second half of his script. The working title for the project was Star Beast, but O'Bannon disliked that title, changing it to Alien after noting the number of times the word appeared in the script. Ronald suggested one of the crew members be implanted with an alien embryo that would later burst out of him, feeling that this would be an interesting plot device by which the alien creature would get aboard the ship. During the scripting process, O'Bannon always pictured Giga's design as the alien. With most of the plot completed, Shusett and O'Bannon approached several studios with their initial script, pitching it as Jaws in space. Close to signing with Roger Corman's studio, a friend passed the script on to Gordon Carroll, David Geiler and Morta Hill of Brandywine, who had ties with 20th Century Fox. After signing a deal, Waterhill and Guyla were unsatisfied and made numerous rewrites and revisions to the script, causing tension with O'Bannon and Shusett. Since Gil and Guyla had very little experience with science fiction, Dan worried that they would change enough in an attempt to take his name off the script, claiming it as their own. However, Walter and David did add some substantial elements to the story, including the android character Ash. Walter and David drafted eight different versions of the script, exploiting the Ash subplot whilst naturalising the dialogue and trimming some sequences set on the alien planetoid. Despite this, 20th Century Fox were not confident about financing a science fiction film, but after the success of Star Wars in 1977, the studio's interest in the genre surprisingly increased. Gordon Carroll said when Star Wars came out and was the extraordinary hit that it was, suddenly science fiction became the hot genre. O'Bannon recalled that they wanted to follow through on Star Wars, and they wanted to follow through fast, and the only spaceship script they had sitting on their desk was Alien. As a result, Alien was greenlit, with an initial budget of $4.2 million. Initially, there were difficulties in finding a director. O'Bannon, although originally wanting to direct Alien, he was passed up by 20th Century Fox for Walter Hill. Hill declined due to the required level of visual effects and not having the patience for them. Many other big name directors were considered, but O'Bannon, Shusett and the Brandywine team wanted a director that would push for an A-grade film, instead of treating it as a B-monster movie. All had been impressed by Ridley Scott's work on The Duelists from 1977, and they had made an offer to him to direct Alien, which Scott quickly accepted. Inspired by the story, Scott, an avid visualist, created extensive storyboards, including the spaceship and space suits, taking inspiration from 2001 A Space Odyssey and Star Wars, and impressed 20th Century Fox doubled the film's budget from 4.2 million to 8.4. O'Bannon introduced Scott his own inspiration, the artwork of H.R. Giger. Giger's painting, Necronom 4, embodied everything they wanted from the film's antagonist, and they asked the studio to hire him as a designer. Hans Rudi Giger was a contemporary surrealist artist, educated in architecture and industrial design, yet preoccupied by the biological and organic form. The two influences are melded in Giger's instantly recognisable biomechanical visual themes. Although most widely recognised for his work on the Alien films, Giger was prolific in all aspects of his artistic career, lending his visual style to film direction, architecture and video games as well as designing furniture, album covers and even guitars. For Alien, Giger would work on all aspects of the Alien and its environment including the surface of the planetoid, the derelict spacecraft and all forms of the Alien from the egg to the adult. Giger began working at Shepperton Studios in July of 78 and finished in December. With its relatively small budget for the time, it certainly wasn't a small movie. Ridley Scott was constantly under pressure from the producers to get the shots done, which caused great tension. 
the crew were behind Ridley all the way and felt he was producing plenty of setups to remain on schedule and they had no idea why the producers and Fox were breathing down his neck because they were so impressed with the dailies. The set pieces were huge, the main spaceship and the corridors to the main rooms were all connected so the cast felt they were on a real spacecraft. The confinement helped add to the thriller aspect, like there was no escape, which really helped the actors and their performances to heighten the scale of the space jockey and the exterior of the Nostromo as it landed on the planetoid. They used Ridley's children and one of the cameramans so everything around them looked bigger, a very simple yet clever technique. Dan O'Bannon and Ronald Chusep wrote all the film's seven roles as generic male characters, with the suggestion that the crew is unisex and all the parts are interchangeable for men or women. Scott was therefore free to interpret the characters as he wished and to cast accordingly. They wanted the Nostromo's crew to resemble working astronauts in a realistic environment, a concept summed up as truckers in space. Ridley Scott sought to hire strong actors for the film so he could focus his direction on creating and capturing a specific visual style which has become a common practice of his. Ridley Scott wrote several pages of backstory for each character. Tom Skerritt plays Dallas, the captain of the Nostromo. Dallas is a very relaxed and approachable captain but always tries to avoid getting into arguments and heated debates. He sticks to the rules and doesn't want the extra stress, especially when dealing with Ripley and her disagreements with science officer Ash and his attempts to deal with the facehugger. Newcomer Sigourney Weaver plays Ripley, the warrant officer aboard the Nostromo. Sigourney Weaver was well known for her work on Broadway and Ridley Scott was so impressed with her audition. Sigourney was the last actor to be cast for the film as the sets were being built and this would end up being her first film. Veronica Cartwright plays Lambert, the Nostromo's navigator. Veronica had been in other horror and science fiction films such as The Birds and Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Having first read for the character of Ripley, she thought she was cast for that role. It was only at a wardrobe fitting in London that she was informed she had in fact been cast as Lambert. Veronica wasn't keen on Lambert's character because of her unstable emotions, but Scott explained it represented the audience's feelings. Harry Dean Stanton plays Brett, the engineering technician. Harry wasn't a fan of science fiction and monster movies and took some convincing from Ridley before he would take on the role, reassuring him that it would be more of a thriller. The character Brett rarely speaks up and just agrees constantly with his close friend Parker. Yafat Koto plays Parker, the chief engineer. Yafat was apparently chosen to add diversity to the Nostromo's crew. His character is very much a union guy who will only assist the crew to his advantage and always complains about money. Yafat drove Ridley nuts with his constant ideas and suggestions. John Hurt plays Kane, the executive officer and eventually the alien's host. John was originally desired for the role but became unavailable. His replacement unfortunately became very ill as filming commenced, not knowing he was a diabetic. And luckily John soon became available and was recast. Ian Holm plays Ash, the ship's science officer, who is revealed to be an android. Ian was the most experienced actor of Alien's cast, a staff on theatre with little experience of film, but his acting style translated effortlessly. For most of the film scenes, the alien was portrayed by Balaji Badejo, who they discovered in a local pub. A latex costume was specifically made to fit Balaji's nearly seven foot slender frame. Balaji attended Tai Chi and mime classes in order to create convincing movements for the alien. For some scenes, they used stuntmen for the killing of Brett and when the alien is shot at the escape pod spacecraft. Scott chose not to show the alien in full throughout most of the film, which did surprise the production team, who would help create the suit. He wisely chose to show only pieces of it, while keeping most of his body in shadow in order to heighten the sense of terror and suspense, so the audience is always wondering where it is. The film opens with a ginormous mining spacecraft called the Nostromo returning to Earth. The ship has a crew of seven who are in stasis for the long journey home. The spacecraft picks up a possible distress signal from a nearby planet and the ship's computer known as Mother awakens the crew. Dallas reveals to the disgruntled crew that they are not home and they have orders to investigate the signal. The Nostromo lands on the unknown planet and Captain Dallas, Kane and Navigator Lambert head out to investigate. As they make their way through the rough terrain they discover the signal was coming from a derelict alien spacecraft. Lambert, ever nervous, wants to go back but Kane insists they must go on. 
they make their way inside and find the remains of a large alien creature, whose ribcage appears to have exploded and Kay notices a burnt out floor, which leads down to another room. Back on the Nostromo, Officer Ripley attempts to translate the transmission and finds it might not be a distress signal, but a possible warning. She wants to retrieve the others, but is stopped by the ship's science officer, Ash, insisting she stays. In the alien ship, Kane discovers a vast chamber containing hundreds of egg-like pods. Upon inspection, the eggs appear to be alive and a spider-like creature springs out, cracks through his space helmet and attaches itself to his face. Dallas and Lambert return the unconscious Kane back to the Nostromo. Ripley refuses to let them aboard, suggesting everyone would then be at risk. But Ash violates protocol, overriding Ripley's authority, and lets them in. The crew attempt to remove the facehugger from Kane's face, but with every move its grip tightens, and it reveals to have blood of corrosive molecular acid, a great defence mechanism. Eventually it seems to let go of its own accord, and dies. Kane awakens not remembering anything that happened, apart from a nightmare involving smothering. Before they return to stasis for the rest of their journey home, the crew have their last meal. Kane begins to choke and convulses in pain. The crew struggle to help him and suddenly a small creature bursts from his chest, killing Kane instantly, then shoots off into the depths of the ship. The crew attempts to locate and capture it with motion trackers, nets and electric prods, but to little avail, nearly capturing the ship's Cat Jones instead. Engineer Brett is sent to look for him so he doesn't mess with the motion tracker. However, as Brett seeks out Jones, the now fully grown alien appears behind him and grabs his head, cracking it with his extended teeth, and disappears with his body into the cooling ducts. After a heated discussion, the now dwindling crew devises a plan to save themselves, to lure the alien into the airlock and jettison it into space. After 35 years, the visual effects of Alien have really stood the test of time. What still impresses me today is the amazing miniature work. Though motion control photography technology was available at the time and was used heavily on Star Wars, the film's budget would not allow for it on Alien. The visual effects team therefore used a camera with a wide angle lens mounted on a drive mechanism to make slow passes over and around the models, filming at 2.5 frames per second, giving them the appearance of motion. Computers were used to turn the models in different directions, like moving up and down, very simple commands but no control over the cameras. The map paintings were beautifully detailed communicating the large scale of space and the planetoid looked vast. Even in high definition it looks fantastic today. The only bits I thought had issues and does show its limited budget was the explosion of the Nostromo at the end. The slit scan technique was used to create the beams of light and fire. The first explosion really brings across the size of it, but they cut the sequence so it looks like three explosions, with the final shot repeating the first explosion in its original length. It's only on screen for a matter of seconds, but I always felt it could have had a stronger design or lasted longer, being more spectacular to add to your sense of relief that the alien is gone, or so you think. The egg in Alien is probably still the most detailed prop out of the series. The exterior and interior of the egg looks so lifelike. I love how Kane puts his hand over it and this quick release of gas is heard, which has never been used again in the follow-ups. How it opens looks more mechanical than the others we've seen on film over the years, but the level of detail has so far not been matched, well possibly in Alien Resurrection. The facehugger and its remains once it's inspected by Ash had chunks of fish and shellfish to create its insides. Like the egg, the facehugger in Alien still remains the most detailed prop out of the series, but lacks the movement and scare factor that was later shown in Aliens. The most famous sequence of the film is the chestburster scene. The cast members knew that the creature would be bursting out of John Hurt, as it was in the script, and they had seen the design of the puppet, but they had not been told that the fake blood would also be bursting out in every direction from high pressure pumps. The scene was shot in one take using an artificial torso filled with blood and with John's head and arms coming up from underneath the table. Chestburster was shoved up through the torso by a puppeteer who held it on a stick and pushed it up on cue. When the creature burst through the chest a stream of blood shot directly at Veronica Cartwright. Shocking her enough that she fell over went into hysterics. All the on camera reactions from the actors and especially Veronica were real and you can really see the genuine shock on their faces. You couldn't have asked for a better take. 
when Ash has his head knocked off, they had a little person inside a body double, operating these chicken-like arms. Ian had to have his head stuck through a table, much like John in the chestburster scene, covered in milk and plaster. Ian hated milk, and with it had to gargle when he spoke. Once they created the disconnected Ash head, Ridley wasn't happy with the final results. Something went wrong in the drying process with the latex, and the head shrank, and was left with a silly grin, but they didn't have the money or time to redo it. There are only really a couple of shots that don't fully stand the test of time, but these scenes are small in comparison to everything else which is perfect. All the incredible efforts made by the visual effects production team earned them a well-deserved Academy Award. The score for Alien was composed by Jerry Goldsmith and conducted by Lionel Newman, as requested by 20th Century Fox who wanted a familiar composer. Goldsmith wanted the score to have a romantic yet unfamiliar quality to the sounds, especially in the opening scenes that would build throughout the film into suspense and fear. In an interview, Jerry said that the film scared the shit out of him when he first watched it to begin creating his score. He wanted to experience the movie as an audience member that would help influence his writing. The soundtrack is one of Ridley's favourite scores, saying it was seriously threatening but has beauty. The editor Terry Rawlings had tempted the film with as much Jerry Goldsmith's music as he could find because he knew Jerry would be composing it. And many films have a temp track prior to the composer coming in to give a sense of how a scene will play out and to set the mood they want. However, when it came to the final mix, Jerry was very unhappy to find they had used tracks from his work on Freud for the opening of the stasis pods and when the acid drips through the floors of the ship. They also used Howard Hansen's Symphony No. 2 for the end titles. It seemed a lot of Jerry's score was too lush and sounded too traditional. The producers and Ridley wanted a more haunting and strange sound. So in the end they downplayed a lot of Jerry's score in the mix and played up the weird sounds. But a lot of what Jerry wrote is in the film and is still regarded highly to this day. The original score as intended can be heard isolated on the DVD and Blu-ray releases. The soundtrack received an LP release when the film arrived, but it was missing loads of tracks, which is usually down to the lack of space on an LP. But over the years, it's been released in several versions, but the most complete was the 2007 version by Intrada Records, which featured the same intended score with additional alternative score tracks and the original LP album on a two CD set. This release is the first to publish Jerry Goldsmith's complete score, remixed and remastered from the original One Inch Master tapes. There were two video games based on the film in the early 80s. We had the Atari 2600 game that looked and played a lot like Pac-Man, as you control Ripley through a maze avoiding the aliens, despite there only being one alien in the film, but it's one of the better Pac-Man clones on the old crusty Atari console. In 1984 for the Spectrum and Commodore 64, a strategy based game was released. Very simple with its graphics, but it turned out to be surprisingly addictive. You give orders to the crew to complete certain challenges, but sometimes they will disobey you if they get too scared. The game was well received and did provide a tense playthrough despite the basic graphics. Definitely worth giving a go. In 2014 we got Alien Isolation, the most effective and scary experience I've had with an alien related video game. You play as Ripley's daughter Amanda as she attempts to investigate the events of the first film. Amanda is on board a similar mining ship and you get hunted down by an alien. You have to hide to avoid being killed and if it gets too close you can use a flamethrower to help you escape. It's the best way to experience the film on an interactive level. It captures the atmosphere and sense of suspense that you'd want from an alien game. It's highly recommended and one of the best alien video games out there. To hear my full review on the game, you can find it on my YouTube channel. Some seven years later, fans got a sequel entitled Aliens, directed by James Cameron. The action was amped up and we saw a group of marines attempt to save a Connolly on LV-426. Aliens was just as successful with audiences and fans of the series. It is often cited by fans as the best of the franchise. Come 1992, fans were hoping to see further adventures of Ripley and her new companions, Newt and Hicks. But sadly, they were both killed off as Ripley lands on a planet inhabited by rapists and murderers. A prison colony with no weapons is attacked by a new alien that has come from a dog, or in the original cut, an ox. 
Ripley discovers she has an alien inside her as well and the company is desperate to maintain her safety so that they can use the alien for their weapons division. The film had major problems with its production, the script was constantly changed and the director David Fincher was treated badly by the crew and the studio. The film was hacked to shreds and new scenes were filmed to create a sense of coherency to its much mangled story. The film was costly for 20th Century Fox and despite its problems was a financial success worldwide but the reviews were very mixed on release. 1997 saw Ripley return in Alien Resurrection, directed by Jean-Pierre Jeannot, despite killing herself at the end of Alien 3. Ripley has been cloned and now has the abilities of the aliens, super strength, speed and can now sense when they are nearby. The film had great visuals and is probably the most graphic and disturbing out of the series but it was let down by its story and didn't offer much new apart from a new alien. Its plot seemed all too familiar. The movie derailed the franchise for some time and Fox moved on to the Alien vs Predator series which are best avoided. In 2012 Ridley Scott returned to the franchise to create Prometheus, a sort of prequel to Alien. It gives you some backstory to the jockey found on the Alien ship in the original film. It suggests the jockeys were the creators of humans on Earth but they were going to wipe out humanity with this alien weapon which would eventually evolve into the alien beast we know today. The original concept for Prometheus was fascinating and it was intended to be a true prequel but along the way writer Damien Lindelof steered the film in a different direction intending to create a new series of films. His contributions left the film riddled with plot holes and messed with the mythology of Alien. The film without a doubt looked amazing, Ridley still has one of the best eyes in the business. The film was successful but existing fans of the franchise were furious with what they had done with it. The advertising promised a genuine prequel but the filmmakers kept changing their mind leaving people confused. It's a prequel but it's not but it is. I just wished they had stuck to their guns and focused on it being a proper backstory to the evolution of the alien, not a new series that just picks bits and pieces from the first film to create this shared universe. I will be covering the sequels in my retrospective form at a later date, but if you want to know my feelings on the sequels and Prometheus, you can find my feature length commentaries on my channel. I originally saw Alien once Alien 3 arrived on VHS. I played the video game of Alien 3 so my interest in the series was building and I wanted to see the other films. I was aware of the movies beforehand but I wasn't allowed to see them even though I saw little bits of Aliens where my sister rented it and I found it terrifying. I couldn't sit through it. My parents were quite strict on allowing me to watch 15 or 18 rated movies. Even though I was still young to see Alien, I watched it and I was just on the edge of my seat. It's a film you know you shouldn't be watching at your age, but I persisted and I was shocked when Kane is killed by the birth of the alien. It's something that will give you nightmares and still to this day the imagery and the sound of his death can haunt you to a certain degree because it's executed with such detail and precision. It's masterful filmmaking. What separates Alien from its sequels is its immense detail and strong atmosphere. It really takes its time to set up the world and for anything to really happen. During that time you get to know the characters and to soak up the sets and it gives you a great sense of the layout of the ship. Many could see this and rightly call it a slow movie and often fans of the series tend to push more towards aliens as their favourite because of this. It has a faster pace, more violence and a bigger story to tell but the slow pace of Alien is all part of its master plan to build up suspense and leave you wondering what's going to happen next. Alien has a very simple plot and it is drawn out over a nearly two hour runtime. In many scenarios that could break a movie but Ridley keeps you engaged throughout without boring you or leaving you disinterested. With its incredible production design and rousing score by Jerry Goldsmith you are just glued to your seat. It may be a simple plot but it's an extremely interesting premise so it raises many questions about the alien, the spacecraft and the characters backgrounds. You always have an open ear to find out the answers to these questions, however 90% of the questions you want answered are never given, so you are left to use your imagination to determine a backstory or an idea that's given to you. The alien spacecraft and the jockey left everyone wanting more info, they gave you that in Prometheus to a large degree but it ended up leaving many folks more confused. 
With all fan fiction or prequels, when you are given those answers, it's never what you wanted because your imagination is often stronger than the eventual answers. It's hard to visualize one's imagination and for it to satisfy everyone. What always fascinated me was the android Ash. They reveal that the company replaced a previous science officer who Dallas worked with five times before they shipped out. So no one knew Ash that well. He seems to fit in within the team and exhibits very human-like qualities. So the audience is unaware of his true identity. It's just when the alien is let loose on the ship, he becomes totally closed off and acts completely different and less communicative, especially with Ripley. When he attacks Ripley, he seems to be glitching as if something has malfunctioned within his system. Maybe he's breaking his programming that he mustn't attack humans, but you never know his main plan. Was he attempting to go back into stasis once the alien was safe? Or maybe being a robot, the alien wouldn't attack him. As I said, the film raises so many questions that aren't answered, or we are only given small nuggets of information, which can be frustrating, but also lead to great discussions with your friends or fans who want to delve deeper into exploring the ideas and mythology of the film. The rich design of the outside and interior of the spacecraft really makes the world so believable. Everything seems to have a function and you believe that everything works. I love the detail of the process to enable the destruction of the ship. It's not like Star Trek or 2001 with their clean interfaces and plain sterile corridors. The art directors and designers have created a working environment more so than Star Wars that pushed that retrofitted and run down look for science fiction. The visuals of space and how Ridley Scott takes his time showing you outside the Nostromo creates a real hostile environment. Space looks so scary and you feel totally alone. It really delivers on the great tagline, in space no one can hear you scream. Space never looked so scary. The cast all provide amazing performances, without a doubt, but Sigourney Weaver, for me, really knocked it out of the park. The one scene that totally made me believe in her performance was when she loses her temper with Parker. You can see the immense stress she is under when she is finally in charge. From that point, she was one of my favourite actresses. Alien is an important part of film history. Like Star Wars, it helped add further to the evolution of science fiction. H.R. Giga designed what is still the most frightening monster that's ever appeared on the big screen. It excels at being a horror, but more so at a thriller. You are constantly wondering what's going to happen next and if the alien will suddenly pop up. Having a female as the lead and the only survivor was a very ballsy move. And from what I can gather, it was the first film to do that. Having just a bunch of regular truckers in space as the main cast was something different. Here was a sci-fi film with believable characters. No one had special powers or looked ridiculously macho and buff. Just regular folk audiences could relate to and who are just put into a horrifying situation. With its wonderful cast, solid production design and of course the top class direction of Ridley Scott, Alien deserves all the praise and respect it's been given over the years. It only gets better with age and it still works extremely well to this day. It's a must see and deserves to be in everyone's film collection. You found this lane there. No blood. No Dallas. Nothing. How come I don't hear anybody saying nothing about I'm this thinking. Place? I say that we abandon the ship. We get the shuttle and just get the hell out of here. We take our chances and just hope that somebody Lambert, picks us up. The shuttle won't take four. Well, then why don't we trust Russ? I'm not going in these drawers. I'm for killing that goddamn thing right now. Okay. It's using the air shafts. That's that. the only way. We'll move in pairs. We'll go step by step and cut off every bulkhead and every vent until we have it cornered and then we'll blow it the fuck out into space. Your 
you have my sympathies. If you enjoyed the video, you can find more on my YouTube channel, and also you can follow me on Twitter. If you want to help support the channel, you can donate through Patreon and receive monthly perks such as updates on the latest news on my channel, early access to reviews and commentaries before they go live on YouTube. Even the smallest donation can help keep this channel going. Thank you.